It's that simple. Investing in yourself is the best way to build and protect and have a strong network. Like and a that. lot of people think like, I just need to talk to people. I'm like, no, you have to have something to say. Yeah, absolutely. You have to have something to say. Be and interesting, so, be added value, be interesting, bring an expertise, bring something to the table. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Maha. Hey, Tracy. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on to my show. I'm excited. I'm excited too. Um, so you know about the show, right? I already explained it to you when I reached out to you. Um, the idea here is to kind of get people fully equipped with skill sets, right? To get ahead in life. And a major skill that people can learn from you, uh, which I kind of learn from you a lot when I watch, <laughs> hear your podcasts and follow you on Instagram, is how to kind of network. You're a huge example. And I want you to introduce yourself because you can do it much better than I can for sure. Um, I want you to kind of tell people who you are, um, why you're on the show, and I'll explain my version as well. So thank you for having me. So I am a communications executive. I do storytelling. I've been doing it my whole life. Um, and I get the great opportunity to work with some really in interesting and important people. And the way that I think I've done that is I've been very successful in how I network. But I've also focused on building right relationships with people. So in my career, I'm born and raised in the U.S., short version, moved to the Middle East 23 years ago. Um, I'm Egyptian, 100% Egyptian. I work for Nagib Sawiris. I ran communications for Google. I ran comms for Netflix for five years um, and worked with a lot of high-profile people in the Middle East, including Sheikh Mohammed's office, the Dubai Future Foundation. So really kind of helping people tell their stories and find their narrative and through communications. And then during the pandemic, I moved back to the US to be closer to my family because I thought like, I'll just ride it out until this thing is over with. And now two years later, I'm still in the US. I have an office in the States and an office here in Dubai. Mm -hmm. And I'm here because of there's a big metaverse assembly and I'm here to do communications and kind of new things like Web3 and NFTs. And so that's kind of why I'm here this week. And I'm just, Excited that we got to connect. I think social media connected us. So you're part of my network now. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of what I do generally and really care about helping people communicate better. Mm -hmm. So helping them find their story and find their narrative. And that's sort of like my purpose now is how do I scale that mm -hmm. to help other people learn how to communicate? Uh, I think that comes hand in hand very much with what we're talking about, which is why I think you're a perfect fit. So our main focus is going to be about networking and, of course, to be able to network, you need to be a really good storyteller, a really good communicator. Yeah. So it all comes in ha hand in hand. Um, why I picked you is because <laughs> you have really big names under your umbrella. Um, you, you do the PR for Gary Vee, huge. Uh, you also consult for Deepak Shup uh, Shup Shupra, yeah. Shupra. Yeah. amazing as well. And what I want to know is how the hell did you land that role? Um, how did you reach out to these people? So this is primarily where we're at. How the hell do you land a role like that? So a couple of things, like honestly speaking, one is I had to put in the effort to build a good career in doing a good job in delivering on my job. Like if I'm not good at communications, none of these high profile people would be talking to me because they look at like, how do you deliver results for people? So obviously working for Nagib Sawiris, working for Google, building Weber Shandwick in the Middle East, building network, Netflix, um, launching them into the region, working for Kadeem, working for Sheikh Mohammed. So you have to have a track record of delivering first. Mm -hmm. You can't start networking with people unless you actually have something to bring value to them. So that's the first thing. And if you wanna be good at networking, you gotta be good at your career or really invest in building a successful track record and your re results. Secondly, the story of how I got to work with Gary is actually really interesting, but quite simple. And I think a lot of people will learn what really that's, that's all it took. Uh, it's kind of funny. So Gary, I, every summer I go home to the U.S. to spend time with my family. And it was the summer of 2017. And I was at the Barnes and Noble bookstore and my friend texted me. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm actually looking for a book to read this summer, because I'm here for the summer, I came to the bookstore to buy a book. Mm. So she's like, you should buy this book by Gary Vaynerchuk called Crush It. And it's a very small, thin book, and it's about developing your personal brand. Like if you 
have expertise and you have a skill and you have something to share with the world, you should build a personal brand around it. Photography, communications, yoga, fitness, health, wellness, fashion, whatever it is that you are passionate about, use your social media platform to tell stories and build a personal brand for yourself around it. So after I read the book, I was like, wait a second, I have a personal brand. I can help people communicate better. I can teach them what did I learn working for Google, Netflix, all these high profile people, what is common about how to communicate and do it well within these companies and brands, and what advice did I give them, and what advice could they take from that in their businesses or their personal brands. So I started following Gary. And one of the things Gary talks about in the book is the power of the DM and the power of making a comment on someone's social media. Don't be shy to enter someone's DM and ask for something and put out maybe 100 DMs and hope that two people reply because you have to make an effort into contacting and networking with people. So that's literally what I did. I Months later, I was in Egypt and there was a big event taking place called Rise Up, which is like a tech summit. And um, because I had been following Gary's content and I've been watching a lot of his videos, he had interviewed this woman named Cy Wakeman, who was like a drama researcher. And I really liked what she had to say. So I DM'd her and I said, I'd really love to meet you. And I'd really love to bring you to the Middle East to speak, even though I don't do that. Like I don't, I don't book speakers. Back at the time I didn't, and I didn't do that as a business. But I thought this is a really good way for me to like get to know her because I really was in awe of her and admire her work and loved her book and just really wanted to be a part of what she was doing. Very, very long story short, DM'd her, got on a phone call, invited her to Egypt. She spoke at the event. Her videographer worked for Gary. So did you have anything to do with the event? Nothing to do with the event. I was like just, organizing it, nothing. I was adding value to my friends who were okay. organizing it. They happened to tell me, we're looking for somebody who can speak about workplace culture. And I'm like, I know somebody. And I'm like, well, I don't know her, but I know I could probably reach her. I can probably pitch her because my job is to pitch to the press. I can probably pitch her and invite her over, used my communication skills, wrote a really good DM sent her an email after that, asked her for her email so she knew I wasn't like a stalker, wrote a professional email, got on a phone call with her, invited her to Egypt. She came, she spent like a week. Her videographer worked with Gary. Okay. So then I asked him, Matt Ligotti is his name, I was like, Matt, I really want to meet Gary. I built Weber Shandwick's businesses, 18 agencies in the Middle East, and they do PR and communications. I'd love to build Vayner Media in the Middle East, a digital marketing agency. Gary has an ad agency. That's what his core business is, is an advertising uh, agency. We should bring them to the Middle East. No one does what Gary does. He does digital. He does content scale. Like, I really think we should pitch this to him. So he's like, okay, well, next time you're coming to the U.S., let me know, and I'll connect you to his business development person. So it emailed his business development person. I'm actually coming to New York. I went to New York and they said, okay, could you stay till tomorrow to meet Gary? And I'm like, actually, I can't. My sister's getting remarried. I really can't extend my ticket in my hotel. I can't extend. And so he said, well, let's move things around to make it work. And we ended up doing it. I ended up meeting Gary. Mm -hmm. And I, he said, you're going to have like five minutes with him. And I'm like, I waited all this time to like change my schedule, change my ticket to get five minutes. We ended up having more than five minutes. But I'm like, what am I going to say to him? that is going to convince him that he should do business in the Middle East and to get him to come. And I didn't have that big of a window to talk to him. So I'm like, I got to think about what's, what's going to be the value I'm going to bring to him in this conversation. And I basically told him about my story and about the region, about why I thought he should pay attention to it. Not trying to sell him on a specific thing, but just the idea of this region. Mm -hmm. this market. Uh, I, I shared with him some statistics about YouTube, how big it is here, how people are very mobile savvy in the region. This is a good market for his business because these are people that are consumers that are tech savvy. So very long story short, I, Gary's like, okay, let's work together. And it took me a while to get to the point of like building how we're going to work together mm -hmm. because I had to learn about him, his business. I live in Dubai. How am I going to run his PR when I live in Dubai and he lives in New York? But he was really open and we developed a great rapport. And I, I actually worked for him for three years out of Dubai 
And then I moved back to the U.S. in 2020. So um, that's basically how I met Gary. And from there, I was like always thinking, here's a person who gave me a chance to bring value to him. So now I have to find a way to bring value back the other way. That's awesome. I mean, there's there's so much amazing with that. First of all, I love the fact that Gary actually opened doors for the opportunity because I feel like most people wonder, maybe I can't add value. Like, this guy is huge, and I'm sure so many people are knocking on his door. Why would he pay attention to me? And a big important lesson I just uh, learned from you um, is that you have to come with value. You cannot come asking. Yeah. Kind of like, I want this. More so, this is what I can bring to the table. So if you just research or learn about the person a little bit, and then also become an expert at mm -hmm. something, right? I love that you said that, that if you're an ex, everybody's an expert at something. We have years and years and years of, of, of life yeah. that you could have something to offer. You could teach something. And if you just work a little bit on that, perfect it, make it, make it valuable to somebody, um, then curate it to that person. So that's, that's amazing. And only speak about what you knew. Like I knew going into that meeting, he had never been to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. exactly. He had never been to Dubai. And so I'm like, I can't go in talking about digital communications, marketing. All, he, that's his thing. All I can do is talk about what I know and my story, like how I was in the U.S. and I went to the Middle East and now it's my home and I've been there for 23 years and this is my observation. And so always come into that equation of you got to go in with what's your advantage. Yeah. What is the thing that you know that you can bring value to? And, and that's how you build a network mm -hmm. is you bring them value first and having the ability and the confidence to walk into that meeting knowing, God, this guy is like a big you know, entrepreneur, runs a lot of businesses and companies, travels the world because he's a global speaker. Like what's the one thing I'm gonna be able to offer him? He has a content machine of like 30 people that have an, I had to find a lane that no one was in and then bring value in that. And when you network with people, you gotta figure out what is the value equation that you're bringing to that relationship. Otherwise, it won't grow or go anywhere. Yeah. Uh, talking about that, building the confidence. I mean, a lot of people will blame the reason why they don't network on the fact that they're introverts. If you're an introvert or if you just think, I'm a bad communicator, what would you say to that? Well, there's different ways to communicate. Mm -hmm. You could email. You could DM on Instagram. You can go up and walk up and talk to them at an event. Like you have to find out what's the way that makes you feel comfortable to deliver what you're passionate about communicating, right? And I even think like, if not me, who? Mm -hmm. And I always put that in my head when I'm afraid to talk to somebody about something. I'm like, well, well, how, how, why are they better, or why, what do they have that I don't? Like, wait, I have value and skills and so you, it's really convincing yourself that if you don't approach them and you don't ask them you have nothing to lose what's the worst they can say like you'll never get an opportunity if you don't ask for it yeah. like if I didn't ask him if I didn't ask for that meeting I wouldn't have gotten that opportunity true so a lot of networking is you have to create an opportunity mm -hmm. and it's hard because it's scary and it's daunting and you don't know them you don't know the reaction you don't know if they're going to think you're too forward or you're too desperate or you're too needy. Yeah. Those are all things that people say with the reason why they hate networking is they hate putting themselves out there. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to put myself out there because I'm going to get um, rejected. So I actually have a situation. I was talking to somebody. They were going to a big event with a lot of high profile people and they really wanted to meet them. And I said... Fans take pictures, partners shake hands, or peers shake hands, mm -hmm. you know? So when you get an opportunity to meet somebody, try to have a conversation with them and build a relationship with them versus doing the transaction of trying to get the photo or trying to be the fan. I love that. If I you go into the mindset, the mindset of you're a peer because you're at that event because you were invited like they were invited, it's a different mindset when you're trying to network. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk, well, let's touch, touch on that a little bit later. I want to okay. talk about how to network at networking events. So okay. how do you get into a good networking event and, and how should you behave? Should you act as an audience member or should you come well equipped, do your homework, have good questions, maybe stand up and ask a question? You know, we'll, we'll touch on that a bit later. But let's talk about um, 
the idea of not being a good communicator, um, and then, I mean, the, first of all, you talk about the, the how important it is to communicate. If you're not a good communicator, is it, isn't the best way just to practice it? Just, I mean, communication is never going to go away. Yep. Even if you do communicate by email or digital or whatever, yep. you're still going to need to communicate. Yep. So work on what you're not good at. That I would say that for sure. Um, and also, the shade that people throw on people that, that are already well-equipped with connections. Maybe mm -hmm. they're born into a rich family or they're um, married to somebody who, 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 has not, who has access, right? So people like to throw shade on people with nepotism. And they assume that, well, I wasn't born into this, so that's why I don't have the opportunity. So they also play victim to the fact that I had to do this from scratch. But I believe you're very much in that situation as well. You had to do things from scratch I as well. I had to do things from scratch. Like I moved, I was uh, 27. I moved from the U.S. to Egypt. Mm -hmm. My father ended up coming to the UAE to build the American University in charge of business school. So I was there by myself with my mom. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't grow up in Egypt. Uh, my father didn't have a family business. We were not millionaires. We were middle-class American living standards in the U.S. Um, so I didn't have that baba and you know, my parents had things that I could just inherit. We didn't grow up with cars and drivers and maids. All that stuff was not part of our, the way that we, so yeah, basically I had to move to the Middle East, find myself a career, find myself a name, build a network from zero. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have it. And it took me a while to figure out how to do it and who are the right circles and how do you meet people. And it came down to being prepared. So the first thing I did when I got to Egypt is I joined the American Chamber of Commerce and they do lots of events. But like, if you're going to go to an event, Tracy, you got to be prepared. Mm -hmm. Look at the agenda, find out who's speaking, find out uh, who do you want to possibly meet? Uh, who are you interested in connecting with? Do they have the list of the other attendees? Like you're not just the speakers that you want to get off when they're coming off in and off stage, but like other people in the room that you think, okay, I really want to meet people that are attending. So really prepare so that you can leverage your time at that event. That's why you go is to network, is to meet people. Like even the small things, like let's say I meet somebody at an event, how am I going to exchange information with them? Mm -hmm. Do I have a business card? Am I going to like have a QR code where they can scan and get my number? Um, one of the tricks that I do is we, if we take a picture together, I'll text them after they give me their number, I'll text them that picture. Because sometimes when you go to an event, you're collecting a lot of numbers and people and you don't remember who is the which number the or the face. That's a trick that I do to make sure like on my phone that I have a picture of them I know and I remember, it's good for me, but it's also for them to remember. So just like, Preparation. When you get to an event, prepare so you can leverage it. So um, assume you're at the event and you're going by your... First of all, is it a good idea to go alone? Or should you take like somebody with you to kind of help you enter conversation? Would you just go up to somebody that you want to meet and be like, Hey, I'm Maha. How do you, how do, you do this with, with the confidence that you know that this person is here to talk on a stage, probably has a huge fan base, 100 people want to talk to that person. So... When you say go to meet people, who are you really tackling? Are you tackling those big fish or you're tackling the gatekeepers, the people that are kind of managing them or the personal assistant or the well, marketing person? Yeah, that's a good question. So depending on what I'm doing, if I'm going to an event with Gary, I'm talking to the gatekeepers so that I can get to know them, so I can really build a relationship with them for any future opportunities. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to an event like this, the Metaverse Assembly or where I'm speaking or an event that I'm going to, I'm trying to make sure I meet the people that are there mm -hmm. that are important either for my business or that might have a good relationship that I can use for one of my clients. It depends on the purpose. Okay. But be prepared. Like I don't go to an event and invest in time away from work, a ticket, a plane, or if it's even in town and I'm going to spend a day there if I'm not gonna you know, learn something or I'm just going to take notes to learn from the speakers, that's value. Mm -hmm. But I would say if you're gonna go to the event, you could watch the event on YouTube if you're not going to try to network while exactly. you're there. Exactly. So maybe not just come in as somebody listening uh, to whoever's speaking on the stage, but also try to meet key people and maybe do research about who's gonna be there, how you could reach out to them. But I think that's the, a tricky part. Like, even if it's a big event here in Dubai, for instance, and I know it's happening, if I don't get invited to this event, how do I 
get invited to the event? How do I speak to the organizer, for instance? Yeah, if someone so, really wants to be at an event, how do you get, you know, how do you reach so out? So a couple of things. Go to the website of that event. Mm -hmm. Find out two things. Do you know any of the speakers? Do you know any of the companies that are the partners or sponsors? Do you have friends that work at any of those companies? Do you know who are the organizers or any of the advertisers? So like I, one of the partners for the event is Emirates. Do I know anybody at Emirates that can help me find out if I can get a ticket? So you have to study. That's again, going back to preparation mm -hmm. and look at the partners, the media partners, the sponsors, because if you don't know any of the speakers or the organizers, there's a really good door to get in is through the media, the, the partners that are listed on their website. Okay, I love that actually. That's and nice. you should follow them on social media and DM them because you can ask them, like, who's the right person? They might give you a general email, right? but it's it's a lead. If right. you get a lead, you got to follow up on that lead. Mm -hmm. it, it requires tenacity. Like, you got to stay after it. Like, if you really want to get to something. Yeah. Um, I think maybe one of the key things as well is to be authentic, to really be genuine to what you believe in, not really talk about what they want to hear, but more so about what you really truly believe in. Because I think in a world like like this, I mean, authenticity is key. You talk about that a lot on yeah, your yeah, podcast. Yeah. By the way, if you haven't already, you should follow <laughs> uh, Digital and Savvy. She has great insight into PRing and and communications. Yeah. I, I literally listen to every single one of your podcasts. Thank you. Um, one important thing is um, going in with like confidence and, and generosity to give knowledge, right? Or generosity to give your time and value to this person. And when I wanted to, something that we, we, we I feel like we didn't highlight properly or, or we could highlight more is the fact that the people that think that it's networking is salesy or um, it's beneath them pushy. or maybe it's pushy or opportunistic. What are the the do's of networking and the don'ts of networking so that it doesn't come off as pushy or salesy or opportunistic. You yeah. don't want people to feel like you're using them, right? Yeah, so that's, a, that's the hard thing with networking is like, are you using your network? Are you trying to gain from your network? Are you giving to your network? Are you nurturing it? Like, it's very difficult for people to build their network if all they're doing is trying to leverage them for their own gain mm -hmm. and not really trying to bring them value. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. So in order to not be salesy and pushy, it's, it comes into your approach. Mm -hmm. Like, are you only contacting people in your network when you need something? Are you bringing them value yourselves? Are you saying, hey, I just want to reach out. One of my friends has this event. Would you love to go? I know I saw you post an article about it. I know you care about this topic. I have a connection. Like, do, are you going to do something non-transactional to help them? Mm -hmm. um, are you thinking about what's valuable to them? So I always talk about bringing value to people. It's not what I think is important. It's what I think you think is important. Like, what's important to you? Mm -hmm. Like, even when we were chatting, I'm like, Tracy, who do you want to meet? Who do, who do, who do you, who can I introduce you to? It's like, I have to figure out what's important to you mm -hmm. to figure out if I can bring you value or not. And that's the importance of having someone like that in the network. And that's always, if you're thinking about other people first, which is very difficult to do when you're trying to build your own network, but trust me, that's the way it works. That's so true. I mean, it really the, works. The if you really try to figure out how you can give and give and give to others and you say, well, if I connect point A to point B and they start doing business with each other and they don't include me, then how did I win? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, if you're giving point A and point B value, and they value you and they're good relationships, they're going to take care of you, maybe not then, but eventually. Mm -hmm. And if not, you learned not to do favors for people who you think are using you because they don't feel you're bring your value enough to bring them along into the journey, whatever you're doing. Yeah, I think that's that's key. It's network, People assume that when they hear networking, they think, what can I get from that contact as opposed to what can I offer? Um, what value do I bring to that person? It's not so much about you right now. It may be eventually, but um, it's also not tit for tat. It's not, okay, so I'm going to make this introduction, so let me wait and see if she's going to connect me with X. So maybe just be more patient. And it's also not right now. Like mm -hmm. that patient thing is the key. Mm -hmm. So when I was in Sweden in June, I met Simon Sinek and I have, I've been read his books and I follow him. And so I know who he is and he spoke. And then we ran into each other at this event, one of the social things. 
And so I went up and introduced myself to him, told him, you know, I don't really have anything to offer him. Like, I don't want anything for him. I don't want him to be a client. Like, I just wanted to tell him something about what he talked about on stage, really touched a note with me. And so I wanted to talk to him about what he delivered on stage. And, and I just gave my contacts and I just told him, like, if you ever need anything from Dubai or from, if there's anything I can do, like, let me know. I wasn't asking for anything, but I was just, I gave him enough information about me and what I do so that if there's a need, he can contact me later. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. It's about planting that seed for future good things to happen. And if you want it to be transactional, like I'm giving you now because I want something now, it business doesn't work that way because opportunities come up. It, it's all about timing. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I might want so, somebody, somebody in my network might need to connect with him. So I wanted to get to know him in case I might be able to bring value to somebody else who needs to talk to him. Right. I don't have any need for it, but somebody I might know might want it. And mm -hmm. so that's another reason why you invest so much in building a good network. So when you're networking, people assume as well that if you network, that means you need to go out to these parties every night and you need to go out drinking and, and like, you know, there's a very banker associated, yeah. associate, like, you know, I, I actually used to think that because I was in finance before and a lot of the networking and the, uh, that we used to do in finance was going out at night and taking clients out. And it just, I mean, I a lot of that. people don't do that. Like you could sleep by 10 PM and still network at decent hours. So it's really about building deep relationships. Um, it's, I think people are over small talk. No one really feels like doing small talk anymore or they don't appreciate uh, you as a human being, mm -hmm. as a heart, as a soul, when it's just about small talk. So maybe a good way to enter a, a good conversation is by really bringing depth into the conversation. Yeah, 100%. Like, first of all, I think one of the things we learned a lot through the pandemic and COVID and remote, remote working and doing things through Zoom, there's a lot of you need to like figure out what's the essential part of the conversation or relationship that we need to focus on because people don't have time and people want to know what's the thing that they should focus on that's important, of right? Course. So even thinking about how you network is like you don't want to waste anybody's time, mm -hmm. period. If people think that you are there to network because you're trying to get something for them or waste their time or not bring value, people don't have time for that. True. And people are very picky about focusing on priorities, focusing on wellness, focusing on their life, their work-life balance. Mm -hmm. So I think also too, like timing is going to be important when you think about your network. I had a person who came to me, it's like, really, I'm really just, can you just give me your phone numbers or the contacts of your people and I'll come. I'm like, that's not really how it works. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's not how it works because if somebody asked me for your phone number, this is like a really important person. I wouldn't give it to them. Like, it just, you can't do that. Like there must be a reason why you're connecting them mm -hmm. and be careful about who you connect because you want to make sure, like I would never introduce someone to Gary that I thought was going to come in, take advantage, do something that would harm him or hurt him, because that's on my reputation. Of course. Right? So who you connect also means something. Of like course. don't connect people together that you think might have bad interests or be a bad actor because that'll be a reflection on you. And then the next time I come to introduce someone to him, he's going to go, oh, well, the last person you gave, it was kind of shady. So Of course. Of course. I mean, it's, a, it's a, a critical position to be in because if you do have the network, like you said, your reputation's on the line. So you don't also want to come off as just passing ass or like showing people like, yeah, you know, I know this person, I know that person, name dropping and introducing the wrong people to each other. It really is your reputation on the line. I realized I didn't answer your question about like the, the, the networking have to be like this nightlife and investing in going to events and parties and like networking seems like a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It, it's it's hand to hand combat and it's not necessarily at events and parties. Mm -hmm. You can do it on a Zoom call. Like, it's hey, during I want to do a business quick hours. It could be during business. It could be during a tennis tournament. It could be anywhere. It right. doesn't necessarily have to be that stigma. Like networking means I have to go to conferences. Mm -hmm. You can network through family members. Yeah. You can network through. Uh, clubs and associations that you belong to. You can network through WhatsApp groups that you belong to. Like, it's not necessarily just by going to events. And I think a lot of people don't realize the opportunity to network is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you think of, if you have that mentality, like I could meet anybody 
in an elevator, on a plane. Yeah. That might be an important relationship. So always have your radar open to that opportunity. So if someone hasn't networked yet, okay, and they're probably listening to this and thinking, oh man, I missed my opportunity. I used to be at X role 10 years ago and I had a great boss who's probably now in a high position, but I lost touch with this person. Is there an intelligent way to kind of open your relationships again? Uh, reach out to a network? Is there like a attack, like something you can follow to kind of say, you know what, maybe list everybody that you know from your past, family members or not, maybe open your eyes to it because a lot of people don't even realize they have a network when they are a network. Yeah, yeah. so look at your education. If you had really good professors or people that worked on your education that you are grateful for, they might stay in touch with other alumni. So school is a really good one. Work, bosses, colleagues. That's why it's really important to have good interpersonal relationships at work because you don't know the guy next to you got promoted and went somewhere else or your former managers. You know, I, I ran into my former boss from like 20 some years ago at a restaurant and she's like, oh my God, where are you now? And then I wanted to stay in touch with her, but I didn't know where she was and I couldn't find her on LinkedIn. So making sure like you take the opportunity for ask their number, look them up on LinkedIn, send them a message, Try to like find a way to stay in touch with them over email. Not asking for anything, but just like I just really appreciated something, a nugget about something that you shared together and, and open that door with something that you, a shared experience that you had. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's like a good way to do that approach. And then maybe maintain those relationships without asking for something at the beginning, right? Um, keeping the door open. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good way to do it. I mean, you could reach out just to say, hey, it's been a long time and I really used to love so-and-so about our, yeah. our time together or working with you. Yeah. And the other thing too is listening. So if they have social media accounts, like follow them on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, listen to what's important to them. Like what are they talking about? What are they usually posting about? What are their interests? So that when you see something that might spark a connection, I could see an article, like one of my friends, this is interesting, she's really um, into Birkenstocks. And I saw this article, the story with the chairman of the company did the story about how it was the work from home shoe during the pandemic. And I really, I never really paid attention to that company before, but I knew she cared about it. So then I sent it to her and I was like, I had this whole conversation and then led to something else. But I'm like, that's the kind of thing. If listening to what they're intuitively excited about, mm -hmm. finding something interesting that you might pass along to them that might, you know, oh, she really follows me. She cares or right. she's bringing value. That's the kind of thing. Even if it's something small like sharing an article, mm. that could really make a difference. I love that. You know, um, now in this day and age with everybody being so busy, what we're talking about is networking and kind of building and nurturing relationships through networking. How do you find the time to nurture relationships with your employees, with your uh, staff, with your colleagues, your friends, your, your family, because this is all part of your network. When we're talking about networking, it's not just your peers or your yeah. business partners, right? So how do you, do you have like a, a strategy or like an Excel sheet to say, okay, I need to keep log of all, my, all the people in my network. I need to make sure I have it in my calendar to check in on this and this person yep. once a month or by, by so weekly. So I'm in Dubai for like eight or nine days on this trip and I have work, I'm here for work, so I have work things to do, but I make time for networking. Like I, there's people that I don't do business with that aren't clients, that aren't, but I'm like, I have to see them every time I come here mm. because they're important to me. So the first rule is make time. <laughs> like carve time out of your work schedule. Like I spend time talking to a lot of people in Egypt. I haven't lived in Egypt for a long time, but I have a lot of business relationships and friends there. Like when I'm in the States, I make time for them. Like I have to, like mm -hmm. I, you can't be too important or too busy to nurture your network. Otherwise you will have no network. Correct. And I don't never know when I'm going to want to bring, you know, someone over to Egypt and I need to know who are the right people to speak to or who is the right person that might want to meet them or might get business relationships from them. So the first rule is you have to make time all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like I do it in spurts. Like I always have to make sure I'm having time on my calendar to meet and talk to people that have no current interest in my current to-do list. Mm -hmm. If I only thought about the here and now of what I have to do today, I won't have a network. 
That's true. Because you don't need them and use them and work with them all the time. It's just, it's a kind of a, a fluid situation where like, okay, like tomorrow I have a meeting with someone who I have no really business with, but I like, I really want to make sure that I stay close to that person mm -hmm. and I haven't worked with them for a long time and I might not work with them in the future, but they're a good person in my network that I want to keep because they might need something from the States. Mm -hmm. So I might be able to help them in the future. I, don't, I mean, I, I love that, but I don't think a lot of people think this way. And it's a beautiful way to think because you're not just thinking selfishly, but you're also thinking of how you could add value to others. And a lot of people lose track with their own lives that yeah. they only network and they everybody thinks they're very busy. So nobody has everybody a time. Everybody is busy. Correct. Yeah. So everybody knows what they have on their plate that they probably say, I'm going to only network with the people that matter to me right now. And then 10 That's years the down the line, you may lose a lot of the people in your network, people that actually were pro probably people that can't give you something, but are part of your network in terms of your support and your relationships and hear you out and your mentors and stuff like that. So is there a, a good way to, I mean, are you in touch with a lot of people that you you just are, are there for your support, for instance? And is there a good way to kind of keep in touch with them while you have such a busy life? So I stopped working at Google in 2014. We are in 2022, so that's six, that's a long time ago, mm -hmm. right? Eight what, years. Eight years? <laughs> eight years, I do the math. Okay, eight years ago. Yesterday, yesterday, Saturday, I was with like a bunch of Google executives. Okay. Like I'm in touch with them. I want to stay in touch with them. I'm not going back to work at Google. I don't do any business with Google. I will never run, like, but I, I, I want to have my relationships. Right. And so we're always, you know, WhatsApping and talking when I'm in the States and on each other's news and all this kind of stuff. So that's network. I don't have any vested interest in doing any business with them, but I still spend a lot of time with them. Okay. And that's like, you've got to like value people in relationships. I don't talk to everybody, but I know like, who do I care about? You know, be generous with your time for mm -hmm. the people that you want to spend time with. Like, right. you know, even... With my family, like the time that I give to my nephew and his friends or my niece and her friends, like making sure that you find the right time to spend with the people that you care about. And it's, it goes for personal relationships. There are so many personal relationships that are important for business. Mm -hmm. So many. And everyone so thinks the business networks are separate than the personal networks. Like the people in Egypt in Sahel are doing a lot of business on the beach that are very beneficial for the future of their activities. Mm -hmm. The that's people true. you meet in summer vacation, like that's, that's networking. You know, especially now we're in a day and age where work and, and your personal life is pretty much intertwined mm -hmm. and as it should be. We used to think uh, clock in, clock out, 6 p.m. I leave the office, I don't wanna talk about work and I wanna just do my personal stuff. But more and more with how globalization works, you are living and working simultaneously. So they're, they're both intertwined. Um, and you said something that's pretty important that your personal relationships could very much be your network. And when people assume that they don't have nepotism or they don't have an edge because they're not born into a network, yeah, yeah. Um, they don't realize that a lot of people that are born into a network don't know the value of networking. They have no idea how valuable their relationships are and they may never use them, but because somebody else doesn't have nepotism and you know the value of networking, 10 years down the line, you'll be so far ahead of that person who probably does have a network but doesn't know how to do anything with it. So this is something I kind of want to stress because I hear this a lot, a lot, that people are so worried about the fact that they don't have a network. Their father did hand something over to them. Or their uncle or whoever. Or their uncle. Nobody opened doors for them. But it's nobody's job to open doors for you, right? It's your job to open doors for yourself. If you're born into that, amazing. Good for you. But if you're not, you and you make know the value of networking, there's ways to do it on your own. Yeah, I think too, and I touched on this in the beginning, in, in, if you want to have a good network, you really have to invest in building your personal brand and your work experience. Because mm -hmm. if you have that, then it gives you confidence. If you have that, you have a, a reason to talk to people. If you have that, then when they look you up and see who you are and what you do, they might be able to help you in your business. So I think it's really investing in yourself then you is know the you number have value. one thing you need to do to build a network. Mm -hmm. If you haven't invested in yourself, you won't have a network. True. If you have nothing to offer. 
We the will. end. Correct. It's that simple. It's Correct. that simple. Investing in yourself is the best way to build and protect and have a strong network. I and like a that. lot of people think like, I just need to talk to people. I'm like, no, you have to have something to say. Yeah, absolutely. You have to have something to say. Be and interesting. So, be added value. Be interesting. Bring an expertise. Bring something to the table. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I could ask you one more question. Sure. Given the show is about uh, what they don't tell us, what something we could have learned back in the day and we should have learned. Is there anything you know now that you wish you had known before? It doesn't have to be about networking in specific, but is there something that you hold dear to your heart right now that it took you years of experience to find out that you had no idea about before? The only person that's going to put you on the top of their priority list is you. Mm -hmm. And you have to focus on building and yourself and being comfortable with yourself. Like, instead of waiting for your boss to manage your career or waiting for someone to give you an opportunity or waiting for something good to happen for you, you have to create the opportunity yourself. And I always thought like, I was just like, I just do the right things, go to school, blah, blah, and things will happen. No, go create them. You have to do that. You're, you, the only person that's gonna put you at the top of your list is yourself. And so you have to drive your own ambitions, your own dreams, your own, the, the things you want, you can actually create yourself. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't wait for someone to create them for you. And you shouldn't have the expectation that people need to do that. Some people tend to think, well, I know my friend. Why didn't she open the door for me? Or why didn't he do this for me? It's no one's job to open doors for you. And it's even like your job. Like, okay, like that a job will do the work for you. Like if someone gives me the job, then I'll just execute that. Like in my work with Gary, I create the job. Like I create what I want to work on. And then I just say, hey, I'm going to do this. And he's like, go for it. Like, you have the freedom to create if you believe that you can. A lot of people, like, wait for the job itself to just tell them how to do it. Mm. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that I could even, like, bring my own spice to it or bring my own ideas to it. Or I always felt like I had to wait for someone to tell me what to do. When why don't I be proactive and bring an idea? And if they say no, they say no. But at least you can try to bring your own element to it. And that's when I was like, oh, I got to put what I want to do at the top of the list or what I think is a good idea at the top of the list. And then I should try it because nine times out of 10, it'll work because it's something you've observed what's out there. And now you're like, hey, why don't we do it this way? Then it's worth taking that first step. You know, I mean, you hit the nail on the head with that. Something that I, I talk about a lot. I think it's so much harder to think that way when you're in a corporate job because the form the format of a corporate job or at least is to follow was, yeah. is to follow your specific role like job this is what you do this is your box stay in your lane you know so if you kind of want to go out of your lane you you feel like no but they didn't tell me that I can do that so this is what I'm going to do i used to feel that a lot back in corporate yeah. i used to feel like I can't step out of my lane. If they're telling me I'm better at trading than I am at sales, then I'm better at trading than I am at sales. But when I left corporate, I had no option but to hustle and to do everything, whether I knew how to do it or not. When you don't have the money to pay for other people to do it for you, I had to figure it out by myself. The accounting, the legal, the uh, setting up a business, the compliance, everything that I had, that I had yeah. no idea what to do, I could figure out. And there's a beauty to it too, because you end up feeling like, I'm unstoppable. I could really do whatever I need to do, right? But something that I would like to add to that is that if I were, if I knew anything better back in corporate, I would still show my bosses or show, show my colleagues that this is the value that I can add. Do the right research, see what the company needs. What are the company's values? What's the CEO's values? Work around that yeah. and kind of pitch to them what yeah. you think could be an additional Stay within value. the sandbox, but not necessarily conform to it. Like, yeah. just like, okay, here are the guardrails. Why don't I bring my own innovation to this? Why don't I bring my own value to this and yeah. bring my own personality to it? And it, it, it'll probably work. And if it doesn't, it doesn't, but at least you would have tried. You tried. I love it. Tracy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I love having you. Honestly, I really appreciate all of your thank time. You. I know you're very busy here. So thank you so much for yes. chatting to all of us thank about you very this. Much.